Okay, welcome back, guys and girls. Uh, this is the last season of the year, springtime, and this is um, the final couple of chapters here, three chapters we have left here, I think, in the book. And remember, we're supposed to keep track of activities um, ever for every season, so this is the major activity the Ojibwe had in the springtime, and that is maple sugar. So let's take a look at this and see, uh, see how they... So how Omakais and her family survived the winter. Everyone in the cabin heard it. They heard the far off creaking, the groaning, the boom of the lake ice. The lake had started to move again. The ice was breaking up. Once the waves began, huge sheets of ice shoved against each other, pushing towers into the air. Nokomis, Mama, Dede, Pinch, Angeline, and Omakais all ran outside, gazed on the horizon, and saw the crackling and the snapping waves of the ice. They felt the surge of lake water in their blood. They knew at last that the back of winter was entirely broken. Omakaius grinned. Her smile was now whole. New teeth had grown in over the winter. She was older. Soon, spring plants would poke up through dead leaves. The curled heads of ferns, buds, roots, fresh new leaves, fat lake trout would deeply rise from the bottoms. Hungry to be caught. Siskoet and whitefish would fill their nets. They would be able to think of something other than the next bite of food. They would live again, truly live. Angeline went to the mission school every day now. She was learning to write her name and Zangan Zahagagan Mullen. Okay. You're going to have to trust me on that one. I'm sure I got that one wrong, but you know what? That's okay. Which is the white man's language. And she taught Omakaius the things she learned. Using a pointed stick to write in wet mud. Angeline showed Omakaius and Nokomis the meaningful signs which looked like odd tracks. What animal would leave these? Omakaius teased. Be patient, Nokomis counseled. Let's find out what your sister has learned. They're letters, Angeline said, eager to share her knowledge. One follows the next. You look at them, just like tracks. You read them. They have a meaning and a sound. Oh, that's a good idea, like our picture writing, Nokomis said. The girls knew people like Fishtail's father. Day Thunder, who kept the records for the religious gatherings. The Midawin and etched stories and songs and scrolls made of birch bark. They had seen some birch bark writing, and they knew that Nokomis could etch pic pictures into bark, too. She also knew where certain marks had been placed upon lake rocks long ago. Some of the marks were made by the spirits. Some were made by humans. Others were drawn by a giant race of people who had lived on earth in the old days and had disappeared. Angeline's description of her, of the white man's tracks interested Omakaius in spite of herself. The system sounded incredible. Sounds, meanings. But the idea made sense. Thereafter, to learn... The white man's letters and sounds became a source of amusement, for the evenings were still long. Sorry, I chickened out on that Ojibwe pronunciation. I hope you guys don't hold it against me. Hey, said Angeline, tracing the letter on the rough stone of the hearth. A, said Omakaius. B, C, D. She learned to make the pictures. She learned to make the sounds. Slowly, all of them, words would follow. Angeline said, but Omakaius could not believe that would happen. She remembered that last winter, before the sickness began, she had seen Fishtail walking from the mission school. Had he learned to make the white man's tracks? Had he learned to write his name? Had he learned to read the words of the treaties so that his people could not be cheated of land?
Busu Nindi Wa Mana Dikak. Called Fishtail one day. I'm sure I got that one mispronounced, but again, you're going to have to forgive me. He was at the door of the cabin, calling hello to his relatives. Grandma greeted him kindly, for he was ashamed of his thinness and weakness. She brought him in inside. His hair was short and wild as porcupine quills. His face starved and sallow with grief. No longer did he wear the proud, somewhat disdainful look he'd worn when walking seriously along through the woods. His pipe cradled in his arms. He was still Joaquin, with a strong and handsome face, but his eyes were more human, humble, gentle. He gazed pityingly down at Omakaius and touched her hair. Little frog, he said. And there was a hint of smile in his voice, as though to see her brought him comfort. My good wife loved you as her little sister. You made her laugh with your quick ways. She told me you were much loved by the bear people. She told me also that you had a bird named Andeg. Andeg, called Omakaius. And like a dark arrow, her crow swooped down and landed on her shoulder. Andeg looked curiously at Fishtail, wondering whether her he possibly had, had something to feed him. The bird danced from foot to foot, took a strand of Omakaius's hair in his beak, but did not pull. Andig tucked the hair behind Omakaius's ear, just like a grandfather soothing a child to sleep. Awa, said Fishtail in wonder. You are much beloved by the creatures. Over his shoulder, Fishtail carried a blanket, meaning that he had much to say and planned to spend the night. Day Day greeted him holding him by the, by the arms, and the coma stirred up the fire, adding a stick there. A bit of wood in, in exactly the right spot to make it blaze up cheerfully. Mama had made a good stew filled with flaky chunks of fish, and the kettle bubbled hot, hung above the hearth fire, Fishtail took off his big moose hide mitts and Angeline dished up a wooden bowl of the soup, eager for him to sit and warm himself. Because he was related as a cross cousin and also because he had been the husband of her friend and she was familiar around him and not shy at all. She tried to cheer him up, to bring a smile to his face by teasing him gently. Day Day needs snowshoes all winter, but you... Angeline pointed at her lips at Fishtail. Already have yours on, eh? <laughs> Fishtail gave a little smile, but there was still too much sadness in him to laugh. He wiggled his feet, or he, he waggled his feet, excuse me. They were big, it was true, almost as big as snowshoes, as big as old tallow's huge, long ones. Yeah, they come in handy, Fishtail acknowledged. If I lose a battle, I've always got one attached. He took great gulps of the fish broth, and slowly, feeling better, he warmed to the talk with Day Day. They were planning this year's sugaring, a time everyone looked forward to with joy and excitement, as much as ricing, maybe even more, for when the maple sap began to run, it meant warmer days. Pleasant sun, all the beauties of spring were close at hand. The sweetness, just as the raggedy end of winter, Nokomis was excited as a girl, and her enthusiasm made everyone smile with affection. But the creator expects us to be ready. While you talk, you men work. She herself was smoothing out a paddle to use and stirring the syrup. And just the day before Day Day had started hollowing a peeled, smooth piece of basswood for a trough. Now Day Day asked for the use of Omakaius's gun-barreled flesher. She brought it quickly from its place in the corner. She was glad to find another use for Day Day's gift, because besides the usual, usual unpleasant one of scraping hides. Taking the hide flesher in his hands, Day Day sharpened the end well in a sharpening stone. Holding the barrel in his strong fingers like a chisel, he hit the other end with his mallet, 
tapping the long slices of wood away from the inside of the log. Every strip of wood he tapped from the inside, pinched, grabbed, and threw into the fire. The trough grew smoother, deeper. Fishtail, meanwhile, meanwhile, smoked peacefully and looked into the leaping flames. You get to work, too, Angeline said, smiling. She tossed him a bit of venison jerky, though, for him to chew on when he finished smoking his kinnikinnik. The family sugary place was at the other end of the island. When they traveled to the sugar bush, the family packed as lightly as possible. Once they arrived, they would use the frame set up last year for their big sugaring house. There were, was a smaller wigwam where the tools were stored. There usually was a food cache buried last fall, filled with good things that had lain far beneath the snow. But this year, Day Day had already made a trip to the end of the island and raided the cache to keep from starving. They had already eaten their store during the lean, room, the lean moon. So, this is a springtime activity, a major one, maple sugaring. They travel to the sugar bush, and they begin the process of tapping the trees, collecting sap, boiling it, and boiling it down some more and more to get the uh, maple sugar. When they arrived, the first thing Mama did was unroll the reed mats for the roof of the shelter, then the blankets, then take out new paddles in the cooking pot. Day Day dragged a big kettle and more wooden troughs and paddles from the small storage house. Anything that wasn't at the sugaring place or anything that broke or wore out, they would make for themselves. Nokomis and Omakaius arranged the food they brought. There were packets of split dried fish, a maycuck of special powdered fish, moose meat, a little monoman traded for with deer meat, smoked fish, and a bag of dried pumpkin flowers to thicken soups. Nishke, said Nokomis, happy they had so much. We'll have a good feast. Once the soup was in the making, Nokomis left Angeline to stir and called Omakaius to come along and help chop taps to open the maples. The two wandered a bit until Nokomis found a good ironwood tree. She took out her sharp hatchet and expertly chopped into the tree at regular angles she made a series of perfect cuts down the side of the tree and then chopped sideways and split from the tree ten perfect wedges of the hard ironwood. She did this until she had a huge sack full of wedges, which Omakaius lugged back to the camp. For two days they prepared, knowing that the sap was just about to start running. There was a feeling to that time before the sap began, a quietness that had the going out taste of winter, all that happened in the snow and the cold, the storytelling and the sadness, too, was left behind. Omakaius opened herself to the warming wind. Before them, the sweetness of the maple waited, the warmth of the sun. Omakaius, Twilight, and Little Bee carted heavy rocks from the lake shore to lay down the maycucks and then hauled wood for the fire. Omakaius's arms were tired, and her cousins, too. They complained impatiently to each other as they hunted for the right-sized stones or hauled load after load of wood in their arms, dumping it near the big kettle, which was boiling and steaming away. As yet, not one taste of the maple syrup, just the cold, sweet sap. It was always this way before the first taste. The boiling down seemed to take so endlessly long. Pinch watched jealously, jumped on a log to observe Grandma's paddle. When it came up and dipped back down again, still not ready, still not, still not, then ready. Onto the surface of the big maycuck filled with clean snow, Grandma dribbled a thin, dark, gold stream of syrup. Pinch could hardly wait for it to cool. Gum sugar! He grabbed, 
grabbed while it was still a soft rope, swung the strand into his mouth and ran for once quiet and, st- and ran for once quiet instead of yelling. Only because his mouth was stuffed and Andag was caught up in the excitement and he jumped from foot to foot, nearly tumbling from Omakaius's shoulder as Angeline poured out more syrup and then helped Grandma ladle the rest into the sugaring trough. He pecked out a bit of, a bit of the syrup, but didn't seem to like the sticky feel of it in his beak and shook his head comically. He put his head in the snow, wiped his beak back and forth, but couldn't remove the hardening syrup. He flew up to a low branch and glared down at them, betrayed, preening his feathers, making his feathers sticky with the syrup, too. Mino Pogwad, said Omakaius, licking up a dollop of thick syrup. The first taste usually made her smile. Not this time. Sadness overwhelmed her when she tasted the sweetness. She instantly recalled the special day she spent with Niwu on the shore of the lake. On that day, long ago last summer, she had freed him from the the tight bonds of his tinkanagong, let him tumble and play. When it came time to put him back, she sweetened his confinement by placing her last bit of maple sugar on his tongue. You remember that? Chickadee, my brother, she cried to Niwu under her breath. She looked around. Pinch was running and jumping, striking out with a stick and pretending to hunt doves. Nokomis was stirring the syrup using a dancing kind of smooth movement with her arms. Mama was putting together a stew and Dede was off somewhere with fishtail, planning ceremonies that would be held during the sugaring, not far from their camp. Angeline looked at her and said, Nishme, go get some more wood. She Omakaius was the only one thinking of Niwu. The knowledge made her lonely. If only she could talk to him, look into his cheerful, upslanted eyes. Share with him her feelings that he never laughed at. Play with him in her arms. She missed him terribly. So much so that her heart seemed to drop right through her stomach with a thud. Muffling her cries, she ran from camp, straight out into the woods. Angeline was surprised. Usually her sister did not fetch wood with such enthusiasm. Hoa! She called after her little sister. Megwetch! Omakais knew that she would not come back. However, Angeline could fetch her own wood. She ran with an angry heart. Breathing hard, skimming away as fast as she could, she got away from everyone before she sat down on a little patch of dry, sunny ground. At last, it was all right to sob and sob, let herself cry as much as she wanted to. But the strange thing was, as soon as she sat down, she didn't feel like crying anymore. She heard the song of the white-throated sparrow and was soothed by the piercing refrain. She smiled. Niwu's spirit was comforting her. Her eyelids got heavy, the sun warmed her, and she was just about lost in a dream when she was startled by the crackle of sticks and twigs, the shuffle of feet, the interesting snuffling, and most of all, the commanding and unmistakable odor of bear. They were with her, standing quiet at the edge of the little spot of sun, Two young bears gazed curiously, knowing it, knowingly at Omakaius. Andeg flew down suddenly as though he, the little crow, had to protect her from her brothers. The two bears startled a bit at the crow's angry charged, charge, but then shrugged and ignored him. It's okay, said Omakaius, and Andeg returned to her shoulder. The bears continued to look closely at Omakaius peering with their dim, bare eyes, taking in every dot of her scent, remembering it all 
knowing how Micaiah wished that she had something to give them. She had run away from camp with nothing more than a handful of spirit tobacco in her pocket. They kept looking at her, waiting and watching. The only thing she could think of to give them in the end was some human advice. She decided to warn them about other humans and the dangers they posed. There's a woman, Omakaya said.